At the far end of Warframe progression lies a weekly high level mission to really put your arsenal to the test. This mission is the Deep Archimedia. How do you unlock it? How do you beat it? And what's in it for you? I'm the Engineer, let's solve a practical problem. In order to unlock Deep Archimedia, you must have both completed the quest Whispers in the Walls, as well as reached rank 5 with the Carvia Syndicate. You can complete the lower tier variant, Netra Cells, prior to reaching rank 5 for lower challenge and lower rewards. I'll cover rewards between these two missions in the last section of this video. When you first gain access to Deep Archimedia by speaking to Necroid in Sanctum Anatomica, you'll be presented with a challenge screen. By spending two Netra Cell search pulses here, you'll unlock access to Deep Archimedia missions for the week with these challenges. The challenges shown do not change during the week, bugs aside, locking you into finding some way to make this work. These challenges include a selection of three Warframes, which can include ones you don't own, a selection of three primary weapons, secondary weapons and melee weapons, again this can include ones you don't own, and then four randomly selected individual debuffs. Everyone has the same four show up for that week. If you don't have any of the Warframes or weapons, you have the whole week to pick some to obtain and set up for Deep Archimedia. For each challenge you meet, you gain one additional research point per mission completed, up to three total points for completing all three of the week's missions. Based on how many challenges you meet or select, you can see at the bottom how many research points a successful run would earn you. These research points all lead into the rewards you receive. Research points do not stack, you are only rewarded on the highest you earn in a run. Should you do only a partial run, or a run with lower points, then try again with full points, you'll receive the partial rewards the first time and the remaining rewards on the second run. In order to proceed to the most rewarding variant, Elite Archimedia, you must complete a deep Archimedia run with all challenges met. That's a matching Warframe and weapon set, all four individual parameters turned on, and successfully going through all three missions. If that wasn't hard enough, the missions are back to back. You do not have any opportunity to change your loadout in any way between missions once you start the first. For this reason, you must set up your arsenal to accommodate all three missions in full. If you fail on mission two or three, you'll have to repeat the earlier missions before trying again. The missions themselves also have significant challenge to them. Each is rated at level 250 plus, each comes with a deviation which amplifies mission difficulty, and each comes with a risk variable to further amplify mission difficulty. These should be very carefully considered when choosing your loadout and approach. Once you've completed a max difficulty deep Archimedia run, this will permanently unlock the toggle option to turn on Elite Archimedia. This provides you with the same missions and challenges, except an additional risk variable is added to each mission, and the enemy levels jump from 250 plus to 375 plus. In order to get the absolute maximum rewards, you will need to complete an Elite Archimedia with all challenges met, running all three missions successfully. However, you may choose to skip one single requirement, such as picking a different Warframe. This surrenders the final reward of 50 Vosphor, while still claiming all the very limited rewards from Deep Archimedia. Beyond just the challenges, there are a few global restrictions to make the mission even more difficult. While in Deep Archimedia, you can only deploy each consumable once every three minutes, unless otherwise blocked by a challenge. Enemies get extra health and shields beyond their levels, similar to Steel Path, as well as spawning more frequent Eximus. Self-revive is disabled, and Operator's Last Gasp is nerfed to have a shorter time limit to pull off your recovery. Players in Bleed Out have reduced timers each time they go down, to a minimum of only 5 seconds. Lastly, players who fully die can be recovered after 30 seconds by finding and defeating a Void Angel bearing their glyph. This angel only has one health bar, but gets considerably stronger each time someone dies. Basically, you need to bring your A game. Now, as much as the difficulty is getting piled on with Deep Park Media, they are still plenty doable. You can go in solo if you want to prove something to yourself, but the better option is to run with a pre-made team of four people. Coordinate within the team to pick appropriate Warframes to support each other. For example, one person might bring Trinity, if she's an option for them that week, allowing others to focus less on energy and tank as that'll be provided to them. Likewise, if your weapons are poor, you can still mod for support to be a primer and assist your teammates that way. After all, a status ridden demolisher is much easier to stop and kill than one with no debuffs on it. 
beyond your random loadout, you can also bring two loadouts with no regular restrictions on them. That is your operator and your necromech. Your operator means you can select your choice of focus call, amp and arcanes all to support either you or your team. Vazarin can be great for keeping your team alive and grouping enemies. Xenric to keep energy going and slow down big enemies. Naramon to focus on melee and to suspend enemies. Madurai to enhance your amp and weapon damage in key moments and provide extra strength. Or a Nairu to remove enemy armor while also protecting from slows and knockdowns. Similarly, your Nekmek can be a big bruiser on demand to help deal with heavier or swarming enemies. If you're stuck with support options for frames and low damage weapons, this can be your backup plan to contribute. Just be mindful that deep Archimedia modifiers can get in the way of these two. Transference Distortion, a personal modifier, will prevent switching to operate a Nekomek, including disabling Last Gasp. Similar to that modifier, various others can be navigated with careful loadout selection. Abbreviated abilities, which reduces all ability duration to one quarter of their modded values, can be bypassed by simply not using duration-based abilities. For example, using charge-based abilities like Mesmerskin, fixed duration abilities like Crucible Blast, or toggled abilities like Gloom, if you have the energy to support it. Ammo Deficit grants you very little ammo recovery. Evade this with Incarnan weapons that effectively generate their own ammo, or Battery and Exalted weapons which bypass the issue entirely. This applies similarly to the Ammo Scarcity modifier that drains your ammo reserves over time. Concussive Drain, losing energy when you take health damage, can be avoided by either building to not need energy, or to not rely on health hit points. Shield Tanking, Evasion, or being Lavos for example works here. Lethargic Shields, increasing normal shield regen delay to 6 seconds for partial damage, or 24 seconds on a full break, can be avoided by restoring your shields manually such as with the Augur set. The Powerless modifier, disabling abilities until 50 kills, includes your allies getting the kills. In a full squad, each player only needs 13 kills on average to break out of this restriction. Look to using Operator Mode to protect or buff yourself until you have access to your abilities. The Eroding Senses Deviation, unique to Mirror Defense, will constantly weaken the Oracle and Vitrium. You can go around collecting glyphs to restore their health, or if you have the power, you can summon and defeat a rogue Nekomek. This will take 45 seconds off the defense timer each round, skipping a lot of time that would otherwise be spent draining hell from the objectives. Of course, make sure at least one squad member can still adequately hold back the normal enemies, and that your squad can quickly kill the Nekomek once spawned. Do remember that you can't heal the defense objective with Warframe abilities, even ones which can heal objectives in a normal defense mission. You can instead place down an Ancient Healer Spectre to grant damage reduction for your team. For any mission that forces you against Nekomex, whether through deviation or otherwise, a high output radiation weapon, coupled with Cold Prox to slow them down, is crucial as you cannot bypass their armor. And finally, for any mission deviation or risk variable that adds either more Xmas units or gives every unit overguard, you'll probably want to move away from crowd control reliant warframes. Either that, or have an ally able to keep you alive. For all the other modifiers, their effects are either something to push through, or something that can be relatively ignored. I doubt you need advice on how to deal with a game only spawning ranged enemies, just kill them. Throughout the missions, the biggest power boost you can have is a pre-made team. I don't mean you need to be on Discord making callouts like it's a professional tournament. I mean just having players cover different roles. I've been running Deep Archimedia on stream live on Twitch with viewers. One week I paired my Dante for defense alongside a Nyx for crowd control. In another week someone turned Loki into a tank, protecting the entire squad during the assassination mission. But if you and your friends are still struggling, there's one last workaround you can do run the mission twice. The first time, two squad members bring optimal gear with modifiers turned off. They power through the mission while the other two squad members get the full research points. Then you all run the mission again, swapping roles so the other two players get full points. In this way, you and your friends can take turns to use your favorite equipment. Whichever way you go about it, you've got your loadout, your challenges, your squad, and you manage to power through the toughest missions outside of endurance. So what's the reward for doing all this? As I mentioned earlier, completing the missions with challenges met grants research points. Each time you meet a new research point threshold for the first time in a week, you also gain the reward associated with that threshold. 
follow-up runs do not add to the research points, requiring you to meet all the challenges to get all the rewards. At 15, 28 and 37 research points are three fixed rewards of 3 Entrite Landforms, 20 Vosphor and 50 Vosphor respectively. There's also the one-off rewards. At 25 points, you unlock Elite Archimedia, and at 37 points, you get the Archimedian Eye Sumdali to put as a hood ornament on your landing craft. The other rewards are all from randomised drop tables. At 5 and 10 research points, you receive a reward from the Silver Table, which is identical to the new drop tables for normal Netracell runs. At 20 and 31 research points, you receive a reward from the Gold Table, then at 34 research points, you receive a reward from the Legendary Table. As you can see, all of these tables are capable of dropping the Legendary Melee Arcanes and Tau Forged Archon Shards. In fact, completing an Elite Archimedia run with all challenges met will reward an average 1.26 Tau Forged Shards, 1.5 Melee Arcanes, 0.4 Melee Arcane Adapters, and 1.84 Normal Archon Shards. As the Silver Table is identical to a normal Netracell run, all the other rewards are extras on top. Regardless of the reward you're hoping to obtain, Elite Archimedia is better value for your search pulses than a pair of normal Netracells. You can of course still run three normal Netracells every week in addition to the Elite Archimedia run. In a previous video on Netracells, I pointed out how it would take the average person, without trading, 83 weeks to max out both legendary melee arcanes. That same average person back then would also receive 91 Archon Shards a year, of which 19 and a half would be Tau Forged. If you still run Netracells only, this has been improved significantly. It now takes the average person 47 weeks to max out both legendary melee arcanes without trading. Likewise, that same average person will receive 169 Archon Shards a year, of which 32.5 would be Tau Forged. But if you go for maximum rewards, running an Elite Archimedia and three Netracells, you'll get on average 262 Archon Shards a year, of which 85 will be Tau Forged. On top of that, the average person would max both Legendary Arcanes, without trading, in 23 weeks. All told, that's nearly three times the Archon Shards, more than four times the Tau Forged, and less than a third of the Arcane grind time compared to Netracells on release. Compare this to Archon Hunt, where you get 52 shards a year, including an average of 20 Tau Forged. While that is in addition to the sortie level reward granted after all three missions are done, the difference in payoff is huge. All you have to do is have a very complete arsenal, or have a couple friends. Naturally, this means half the people watching this video have no chance and should go complain on Reddit. Deep Archimedia will test your arsenal, the variety of well-built options you have, and the power of a team you can bring together. Each week will be, in some detail, different to keep you on your toes, requiring full mastery of the Tenno arsenal, not just the meta of the day. In terms of Archon Shards, it is easily the most rewarding mission we have. I hope this video gives you the perspective you need on what challenges you'll face, ways to overcome them, and just how valuable the rewards will be compared to past options. That's all from me for now, so as always, build wide, run deep, and fight well, Tenno.